Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believe. Have you ever been confronted with a mountain and you try to move it by commanding it to be uprooted and yet nothing happened? Have you wondered why that was the case? Why couldn't you cast out that devil? How come you even said in the name of Jesus and nothing happened? In this message, God's Choice Servant, Pastor Chris Oyakolome, breaks it down and brings forth insight into the dimension of faith that makes everything possible. Let's tune into the message already in progress as we learn what it means to believe, to operate the faith that moves mountains and command authority over all things. Anything is possible to him who believes. Can we share something from the Bible? You know, we've been talking about everything or anything is possible. You believe anything is possible? Jesus said so. Anything is possible. I said anything is possible. Glory to God. Anything is possible. If you can only believe. And it's not hard to believe. It's a choice. It's a choice. You choose to believe. There are people who have chosen not to believe. Not because they cannot believe, but they chose not to believe. And you know, if you don't believe, God can't help you. Because in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the Bible says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It is impossible without faith to please God. No option. And then also, we need to understand what the Bible teaches. You know, a lot of times, there are people who assume that they know the Bible. They assume they know the Bible. They assume so many things. They think are in the Bible. Have you ever heard somebody say, the Bible says heaven helps those who help themselves. The Bible doesn't say that. If you could help yourself, heaven will have, have to help you. Come on. That verse was taken out of a book titled if the devil wrote a Bible. That's where, it, that's where it came from. I've seen the book. It started, if the devil wrote a Bible, he would say. And one of the verses is, heaven helps those who help themselves. You know, people say things as though they're really in the Bible. How many of you ever attended the funeral service? Anybody here? You ever attended a funeral service? Okay. Did you hear that minister say, you know, dust to dust, you know, and why are they doing that? The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Have you ever heard that? And then, of course, most of us are acquainted with this. They come on television. An announcement is obituary and then they say with gratitude to God we regret to announce a bundle of contradiction with gratitude to God but we regret to announce how can you regret something for which you've just given thanks you know what they're actually saying well, we couldn't resist his will. 
Thank you for what you've done, but we don't like it. <laughs> That's what they're saying. Because they have this idea that God is a monster. And when they think of this monstrosity of a being, they see a hawk that sneaks up upon you and takes a loved one away. And so they try to identify with Job. You remember Job? We talked about Job the other day. Oh boy. Let's look at something here. In Job chapter number 1. And verse. From verse 20. You remember what he lost. His children. Were killed in one day. His business was run down the same day. He lost everything. Lost everything at once. In verse 20, the Bible says, Then Job arose. If you don't know the book of Job, turn to the table of contents, all right? Then Job arose and read his mantle. That's an overcoat. Have you seen this thing? You know, have you seen this thing? They call it mantle. Have you seen it? I sometimes wonder how people read the Bible upside down. There are so many Christians who hold this and say this is their mantle. They think Elijah left something like this for Elisha. The mantle is an overcoat. An overall. It's something you wear. It's not a hanky. So the handkerchief is not a mantle. Not Bible standard mantle. All right. Okay. But um, the anointing was transferred through materials like this and that coat, which means this cloth can conduct spiritual electricity. That's what it means because the woman touched the hem of Jesus' garment and she was healed. And Jesus said, who touched me? Because virtue has gone out of me. Praise God. But you know, that's not to say that the hanky or the apron from the body of Paul were called mantle. They were not mantles. A mantle is an overall, an overcoat. So the next time you pick up your hanky, don't say, this is my mantle. It's not. All right, I just thought to show you that. Um, it's in verse 20. Then Job arose and read his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. Then he made this blunder. Even though he was a righteous man. But he didn't know who the enemy was. He said, the Lord gave. And the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He encouraged God. Because his wife said, what are you waiting for? Don't you think you ought to die? You're suffering too badly. Die. Curse God. Die. Because your sickness is too, is too heavy for you. But he was wrong when he said the Lord had given and the Lord had taken away. The Lord doesn't give and take. The Bible says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Amen. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 11. Read verse 29. Want to go. One more time. That's it. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. In other words, God doesn't change his mind. 
about what is given to you. I tell you what God does. When God gives you a gift, if you abuse it or refuse to use it, he doesn't take it away from you. He will look for someone else and give that person the same kind of gift that he gave to you and then even add to it. Because he's got it in abundance. He never takes it away from you. So God blessed Job. It wasn't God who took away from him. It was the devil. We already read that. It was Satan that destroyed what he had. And but Job thought maybe this was God. You know, sometimes we lose something and we say, well, maybe this is the will of God. No. Until you know that God is not your enemy, you will be whipping the wrong horse. The Bible shows us God is a good God. Amen. He is good. And when you get sick, it's not God who makes people sick. He never makes people sick. Somebody said, sometimes God can make you sick so that he will heal you and get glory out of it. <laughs> what kind of a God do you really think he is? He'll make you sick and then come back to heal you so that you'll give him glory. You think he's looking for all that kind of glory? He's bigger than that. Amen, he's bigger than that. I said, my God is bigger than that. He doesn't make people sick. In Acts chapter 10, when you study from verse 38, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. It was God who anointed Jesus and sent him to heal the sick. God makes people well. And the Bible says, Jesus healed all that were oppressed of the devil. It was Satan who oppressed them. And it was God who anointed Jesus to heal them. So God and Jesus heal. The devil oppresses. It's just as simple as that. Sickness is not from God. Failure is not from God. He doesn't take away from you. He gives you. Hey, come on. Look at the third epistle of St. John. The third epistle of St. John. Now, don't go. Someone is going to the third chapter of St. John. Don't go there. I said the third epistle of St. John. I just saw you. Praise God. The third epistle of St. John. And I want you all to read verse 2. Want to go. Stop there. Stop there. Beloved, what? I wish above what? Uh-uh. I somehow wish. Read it again. Look. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Look at it. You know, someone said, well, that little boy was born blind. Um, that's the way God made him. No, God didn't do it. He said, but he was born that way. Yeah. You think God put the baby in the womb? No, God didn't do that. It's not God. Otherwise, you can say God married them. Did God marry the parents? Was he the minister? Did he speak out of heaven and say, two of you must get married? Did he do that? No, he didn't do that. I said he didn't do that. Amen. He didn't do that. And he didn't put the baby in the womb and cause the baby to be blind and to be born that way. Those things are not from God. The Bible tells us about a man who was born blind. Do you remember? And Jesus and his disciples met this man. And the disciples said, Jesus, Master, 
who committed sin that this man was born blind did he commit the sin or was it his parents that committed the sin Jesus said none of them but that the works of God might be made manifest I must, I must walk the works of him that set me while it is day for the night cometh when no man can work and then he gave the man sight hallelujah you know but that, that that scripture in the King James Version is a little misleading can we turn there because that's what they quote to tell us that sometimes you know God frustrates people so he can get glory out of it he doesn't do that it's in John's gospel chapter 9 he doesn't do that Satan frustrates people now look at this if we cannot tell what is from God and what is from the devil how are we gonna pray then that leaves us in confusion if we do not know his will hallelujah if we don't know the will of God we are left confused and the Bible says God is not the author of confusion He's not confusing. Somebody said, God walks in mysterious ways. He's wonders to perform. He's not mysterious. To be mysterious is to be confusing. It means they can't tell where you're going, where you're coming from, what you're going to do. No. That's not in the kingdom of God. When you are born again, you are enlightened by the Holy Ghost. And that's why Paul prayed for the Ephesian church. That God will grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. The eyes of their understanding to be enlightened. That they may know. Hallelujah. The will of God. Now look at this. St. John's Gospel chapter number 9. I'm reading from verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man. Now I want you to notice where the problem is, all right? I'm going to read it from the King James, and I want you to follow this. A few other versions say the same thing. But I'll show you why they're wrong. There are other versions that put it right. Now, the Word of God can never contradict itself. Amen? Some people say there are contradictions. No, I've studied this Bible. There are no contradictions. There are no contradictions. Praise God. All right, look at it. Verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither had this man seen nor his spirits, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And then we have a full stop. That's the trouble. That's the problem. That's where the problem is. Hmm? Okay. Let me get you to see something about the versions of the Bible. So you can understand why you need to do better study when you read does somebody have the living bible here get me a copy of the living bible if you got one the living bible someone's got one living bible paraphrased okay oh the new living translation okay i want the it's all new living. This is new living. I want the old living. <laughs> okay, well, well, that, I want to read from the Old Testament. Thank you. Now, I want to read from these two versions, and then you can tell me what you think is right. All right? From the King James Version, Isaiah chapter 45, 
verse 11. And I want you all to read that verse. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11. Have you seen that? What's the last line? Again. It says what? Command ye me. All right, let me read it for you just in case you didn't get it right. It's Isaiah chapter 45, verse 11. It says, Thus, thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker, ask me. He says, ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. Now, I can preach for a whole year on that. All right. All right. Let me read the same verse from the Living Bible. And you know, we all love the Living Bible too. Do you love the Living Bible? Okay. We are reading Isaiah chapter 45. The verse is 11. He says, Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel, Israel's creator says, What right have you to question what I do? Who are you to command me concerning the work of my hands? <laughs> Completely different. The one says, Ask me, command me, go ahead. The other one says, How dare you? Or in the same verse. So which one is right? To know which one is right, you apply a law of study, contextual analysis. You read several verses before, several verses after. Plus that, you have to understand the theme message of the writer. And thirdly, his style of writing. When you put those three together, you will come to understand what he's saying, which one is right. And then the greatest of them is to put that in the context of the whole body of divine revelation of the scriptures. In other words, what does this book say? What is the message of this book? You know, a lot of people don't know that. There are many Christians who don't even know what this book says. They have a lot of assumptions. Praise God. That's why it's important that we get to know what we're talking about. Amen. So I want to, I want to put that verse rightly for you. So you understand that St. John's Gospel chapter 9, where we were looking at. Verse 3. Jesus answered, chapter 9, St. John. Jesus answered, Neither had this man seen nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now we have a full stop. And then we go into verse 4, he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now, number one, the answer that is assumed from verse 3, I said assumed, he doesn't quite say that, but that is assumed from verse 3, is that God made the guy blind so that his glory will be revealed. And that's a lie. Because when Jesus opened blind eyes, he gave us the indication that blindness was from the devil. And then he also said that he was sent to destroy the works of the devil, not the works of God. And if blindness, as indicated in the scripture, is one of the works of the devil, then God wouldn't use the tools of the devil 
to try to get himself glory. The devil may do something and God will change it for his glory. But God doesn't do the works of the devil. Amen? Now, this scripture is better read this way because the, 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 uh, the ancient manuscripts from where this particular one was translated was where the problem came in the King James. And so when we study other versions, we'll get the right shade. Let me give it to you. Follow this. And Jesus answered, just follow as I read it, you get it. Jesus answered, neither had this man sinned nor his parents. That's where the full stop should be. Or a semicolon. But we have a colon there. Now, let's follow this. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him, comma. You see that? I must walk the works of him that sent me what it is day. The night cometh when no man can walk. And then, in verse 5 says, As long as I am in this world, I am the light of the world. And when he had spoken, he healed the boy. Now look at it. He says, Neither had this man sinned, nor his spirits. What is he saying? What you're seeing is the work of the devil. What is manifested is not from God. How come they didn't ask? Was it God who did it? Because they knew the God of Abraham will not make anybody blind. You see that? They knew that. They knew the covenant God of Abraham will not make anybody blind. They knew it had to be connected with sin. But in this case... He was not seen. This was just a work of the devil. So Jesus said, But that the work, look at it, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I want the work of God to be shown in this boy's life. What we see now is the work of the devil. But I want the work of God to be shown in his life. So what I must do the work of him that sent me while it is day. And then he healed the boy. Amen. Hallelujah. You have to understand the cancer that you got is not from God. It's not the will of God. You don't need it. You don't require it. Nobody around you needs it. And God doesn't have it in heaven to distribute. He doesn't give out cancers. He doesn't give out deafness. He doesn't give out lameness. And he doesn't cause accidents. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you know God's got a better way than trying to stop you through an accident? You know, he's got a better way. He's got a better way. He's a master communicator. And if you don't hear him, it's because you're not listening to him. Because he said, my sheep know my voice. If you listen to him, you will hear him. If you give him your attention, you would know his voice. Hallelujah. All right. So, that's a good point you must keep right now we'll move to the next one as Jesus told us anything is possible but there are things that frustrate the power of God can anybody frustrate the power of God emphatically yes Jesus said you have made the word of God of non effect by your traditions that's what he said to the Jews he said you have made the word of God of non effect by your traditions there are people the word of God just can't work for. Because of their traditions. This is the way we've always done it and this is the way we're going to do it. Now, Moses 
with a rod in his hand split the Red Sea wide open now where in the world did Moses see that before when you walk with God you have to be ready for something new hallelujah because every one of us is unique he can do something new with your life that is never done with anybody yet and you have to be open enough to let God do something new with your life because he can he says I will do a new thing said the Lord nobody was ever like you nobody's like you today and nobody will ever be like you which means you're called with a specific purpose on earth to do something unique that will add to this world and the kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. See, once you have that idea, you know where you're going. You set your sail. And nothing can stop you because no one has ever seen someone like you before. Glory to God. You understand? No one has ever met someone like you, exactly like you before. So they can't tell how it's going to work. Hey, come on. Look at this. Let's think about... Hmm, um, the lawn tennis player. I think... Um, which, which of them is number one? You, you know their names. Think about the best ones in the world, all right? The best ones. All the best ones, okay? All right, you know them. Now, some of those guys have paid something about $3 million and above. All right? For a good game. Hey, come on. For a good game. That same rocket and that same ball in your hand may not mean much. You see that? Okay, think about the Nigerian player. Kanu. Wanko, right? Good, at least I know that one. Now, he takes a ball to the pitch. He gets thousands of pounds sterling. That's the ball with his, his own foot. When he plays that ball for 90 minutes, it'll be thousands of pounds. Now, you when you take the same ball in the same pitch it doesn't cost that much and nobody may even come to see you the security men may even ask you out what's the difference God no you're getting the idea If you can only discover that thing inside you that's different from everybody else and let it stand up tall hallelujah you'll be it you know what I mean if you just let it come up every man has it in him every woman has it in her it's there in you. It's there. Something about you that many of you have never found out. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, so I said something that can stop the power of God, the flow of the power of God. See, the power of God is present everywhere. That power is here right now. It's working right now. But it's up to us to tap into it. I said it's up to us to tap into it. And when we do, a miracle will take place. Fear can stop the flow of God's power. 
Fear that it will not work. Fear that I'm losing it. Fear of failure. Fear can stop the flow of God's power. So you must banish fear. It's in Luke's gospel. Chapter number 8. <clears throat> I'll give you the background. You're still here? A man by the name of Jairus had a, a little girl, his daughter, who was sick and dying. And he had heard of Jesus. So he rushed out when he found out his girl was dying. He rushed out, looked out for Jesus. Then he found Jesus and he said, Master, my daughter is right now at the point of death. Please help me. Come to my house and heal her. Please. He was desperate. Jesus looked at him and said, All right, I'll go with you. And then, of course, he was happy walking down with Jesus. And then, one daring rascal, a lady, who wasn't supposed to come to the public to stop Jesus and Jairus was fighting for time his daughter was dying and Jesus was look, look at this I want to show you something there you would need to see verse 41 Luke, Luke chapter 8 Verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter. Oh, think about it. And for him to have been a ruler of the synagogue, he was already an old man. All right. About 12 years of age, and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. And a certain woman, having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, think about it, everybody, you know, this lady touched Jesus. And Jesus is supposed to be hurrying to Jairus' house to heal the little girl. And now Jesus is asking, who touched me? We're supposed to be in a hurry. Lord, come on. Let's go. How would you have felt if you had been there? Why wouldn't this fellow own up? Who is it? Everybody said, no, not me, not me, not me. Jesus said, somebody touched me. And he wouldn't let the matter die. Somebody touched me. <laughs> Until, of course, the lady found out she couldn't hide. And she came forth and spoke. Hallelujah. Verse 46. And Jesus said, somebody had touched me. For I perceived that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people. Notice that she declared unto him before all the people some people when they get healed don't want to tell it now that's what jesus wanted the woman to do if she had sneaked home she would have lost her healing there are people who want to get healed and sneak home they don't want to tell it and her disease was a shameful kind if she had been found out before she touched jesus and got healed she should have been stoned to death according to the Bible, according to the law. So Jesus didn't let her hide. He said, somebody touched me. Who did? You think Jesus didn't know who did? He wanted the woman to speak and to testify publicly because that's the only way she would keep the healing. 
Somebody says, well, when I get healed, I'm going to test it out for a little, uh, for a while. If I find out after two days, I'm still all right. Or after 10 days, I'm still all right. Then I'll tell it. If you don't tell it now, there will be no 10 days to tell it. See, spiritual things are very different from carnal things. You don't reason out divine healing. That's why it's called divine healing. It's spiritual. And when it comes to you, you can only keep it by spiritual law. And when God blesses you in any way, you can only retain it by spiritual law. Hallelujah. Well, what's still going on? Verse 48, and he said on the heart, no, no, no. 47 when the woman saw that she was not he she came trembling and falling down before him she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately and he said unto her daughter be of good comfort thy faith hath made thee whole go in peace glory to god now you know you know that testimony would surely have inspired jairus my goodness, if this woman would touch him and get healed, I know we are going to have a miracle. But something happened, and I want you to see it. Verse 49. While he yet spake. You know, sometimes when you hear the word of God, you are inspired. You're blessed. You like it. You're so glad. It's like you are going to make it for sure. By the time you come out of church, everything is going to fall into place for you. But look, verse 49. While he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, that's from Jairus' house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. Trouble not the teacher. That's what they said, the teacher. That's what's translated master here. It says, follow, uh, trouble not the teacher. Your daughter is dead. Give it up. They came to tell him. Master. Too late. Don't trouble the teacher. Let Jesus go. It's too late. Here you are. Expecting a miracle. You know, Jairus, I said he was the a, a, a ruler of the synagogue of the Jews. And then he had an only child that was 12 years old. He must have waited a long time to get that child. And that's the only child. And now she was at the point of death. You know, at that time, you would give anything to get that girl well. You will give anything. Master, please come to my house. I need you now. He was desperate. And Jesus knew he couldn't be stopped. He was desperate. Jesus said, I'll go with you. And then there's this delay. Jairus had a chance. He could think, oh, wow. Why in the world? Whoever said that that old woman to come and delay Jesus? We could have gone to the house before that little girl died. He could have become angry. Could have become upset. Frustrated now. The girl is dead. Jesus waited too long asking who touched me? Who touched me? Why didn't you just go? Forget about who touched you. But Jesus is not that way. You know, sometimes when we in the healing school and we are ministering to people, there are those who think, my case is urgent. Pastor, you got to do something right now. And then Pastor spends more time on someone whose case they think is insignificant. Or I move to the next line instead of their line. I know they're looking at me right now. They're all over there. why but if you understand the move of the spirit and you understand that these things are not man made when we're under the anointing we have to give ourselves to the sway of the Holy Ghost and sometimes you think we're listening to you we're not listening to you we're listening to him because if we listen to you there'll be a disconnection 
So I have to listen to him. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Oh, but what I want you to see is what Jesus did, or what he said, his response to this. That's what I want you to see. So I'm going to read from verse 49 into the next verse. Can we read together? 49, while he had spake, there come at one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Who was he talking to? To Jairus. Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, Jesus heard it. Jesus heard it. He heard that man telling Jairus, Your daughter is dead. Forget about it. You remember he had a crowd around him. Jesus had a crowd around him. You remember? They were still there. Because while he was still talking to that woman, daughter thy faith hath made thee whole that's when that man came and said to Jairus forget it give it up she's dead but when Jesus heard it he answered him saying fear not hallelujah Woo, glory fear not He said, this is your first pregnancy. You just saw blood. Fear not. He said, fear not. Only believe. I love Jesus. He heard it. He was talking. And that guy came. Mr. Jairus, see, the, the girl is dead. Forget about mass. I'm going to hurry away. Just fear not. Only believe. Only believe. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Listen, they're not telling him she's in a coma. They're telling him she's dead. You understand it? She's dead. Called dead. And then Jesus says, fear not. Fear not. What do you mean fear not? It's all gone. Isn't it too late? She's dead. The master says, fear not, only believe. Oh, glory. Fear not, believe only. And she, I love Jesus. He refused to recognize death. Oh, glory. You remember what he did at the grave of Lazarus? When he called Lazarus out of the grave, like he would call a man out of another room. He didn't say rise from the dead. He didn't rebuke death. He said, Lazarus, come out. Like you talk to a living person. Now look, look what he's done here again. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. He says, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. He's not talking about the death. Made whole? You can't make her whole. She's dead. And you follow him to Jairus' house and see, follow Jesus. Come on, can we follow him there? Verse 51, when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in. He put all the unbelieving folks. He, said, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John, and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, weep not, she's not dead, but sleepeth. <laughs> Woo, glory. She's not dead. She's asleep. Wasn't that what he did about Lazarus? He said, our friend Lazarus is sleeping and I want to go wake him up. His disciples said, hey man, if he's sleeping, that's okay. Jesus said, I mean he's dead. Hallelujah. Weep not, she's not dead, but sleep it. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing that he was, these were professional mourners. You know, back in those days, they had professional mourners, you know, to really make sure that the thing was well done. You understand? Uh, you, you know how people plan for a funeral. If they have to celebrate, then they celebrate. If the, if the one who died was an old person, if it was young, then they really have to weep. And now, there are not enough people to weep because it's the only daughter. They have to bring in professional mourners. They are paid to cry. See, 
I said, they go, ah, 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 she's dead. Ah, ah, ah. Then Jesus comes in and says, don't weep. She's not dead. She's sleeping. Ah, ah, ah. Suddenly they started laughing. They had to hold their stomachs of laughter. I said, that's professional. <laughs> Haven't you seen them? They're there. They're trained at the bank. And in some other places, trained to smile at the customer so long as you're bringing money. So, and it, yeah, good morning. It's a professional smile. The guy at the door, he welcomes you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And they laughed in verse 53, and they laughed him to scorn, knowing that he that she was dead, and he put them all out and took all oh born. Look at it right there. And took her by the hand, took the little girl by the hand, and called, saying, Made arise. In her spirit came again, and she arose right away. And he commanded to give her food. She may have died for not eating. And that's a very important point. He said, give her food to eat, because she could die again. Oh, glory to God. He said, fear not. Tell somebody, fear not. See, now you believe, you're expectant. Yes, everything is going to work out right. But then, the bad news, it's worse. Jesus says to you today, fear not. Hallelujah. Fear not. Only believe. Only believe. Thank you for watching. Kindly like, comment, and subscribe. Click on the notification bell so you can be alerted anytime a new video is uploaded. And please don't forget share and be a blessing to someone. God richly bless you. Shalom.